I have to say, and I hate to admit this, it was 30 years ago, uh, me coming out of grad school, um, and before that with my undergraduate, I wish I had had all of this kind of insight. So thank you so much for our sharing. Um, so next up, uh, we have our last panel. Um, and this will be a panel of professionals who are working in a field um, supporting um, organizations that do behavioral health or are doing non-direct service roles. Um, so they will share their passion about behavioral health and how they are contributing to supporting clients. So welcome the panel and Scott Smith uh, with Alliance for Suicide Prevention will be moderating the panel. Thank you. All right. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our last session. My name is Scott Smith. My pronouns are he, him, his and I'm the Executive Director at the Alliance for Suicide Prevention of Lamar County. Um, I'm gonna be the moderator for this panel. So for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll share our professional and personal journeys in playing a support role in the behavioral health field. Some of you may be in degree programs or have interest in systems, policy, or support work related to behavioral health because behavioral health isn't just about clinical care. So why did we choose behavioral health? and how are our roles making a difference? I'd like to introduce Loran Stallins with CSU, Liz Ferris and Maria Van Epps with North Range Behavioral Health, and Malia Cathcart with Summit Stone Health Partners. Uh, why don't we just start by giving a five minute overview uh, for each of us on our professional journey and why we are passionate about behavioral health. Um, to make it easy, I'll just go ahead and call on folks um, down the line. Loran, would you mind starting us off? I don't. I don't know if somebody has my slide. Um, oh, Nikki, of course you do. So um, I just wanted to share a little bit of uh, my journey map. I'm an epidemiologist by training. I got my PhD at the University of Texas School of Public Health um, a long, long time ago. And when I first um, got out, one of the things that I, um, I started studying were um, intentional and unintentional injuries, and particularly among farmers. So <clears throat> when I was at the University of Kentucky, we had a study looking at all of the um, fatalities that occurred um, to farmers. And about a third, shockingly for me, about a third of all of them were suicide deaths. So that was really the entree into wondering why farmers would um, be more likely to kill themselves than other populations. So, you know, clearly one of the links between suicide, suicidal behavior is depression. So we wanted to be able to know whether the link that we were seeing in farmers um, was through a dep depression pathway. Um, as we were doing that work, we discovered that there had been some research looking at um, the exposure to organophosphate pesticides and the role that they played in, um, in depression, anxiety, impulsivity, a number of uh, characteristics that really lead to suicidal behaviors. So we did a, we did a series of studies and, and um, in doing that linkages, those linkages and um, that work continues today. At the time that we started it, for one thing, um, epidemiologists didn't like using, looking at things like depression because it's hard. It's not a, it, you don't have a concrete physical disease that you can look at. And if you then start looking at exposure to pesticides, it gets even more difficult. And the organophosphate pesticides don't persist in a body. So even though exposures might have occurred long time before somebody, um, somebody express suicidal um, behaviors, um, you have to look at, you have to trust people to tell you the truth. So that was really what started me um, looking at suicide related um, issues and risk factors. So I moved to Colorado. Um, we looked at suicide um, ideation and suicide in Colorado among uh, farmers. We did a series of studies that were actually um, evaluating the RAP program. I don't know if you've heard about that today, but it's the, it's the school-based program, prevention program for suicide that's offered through the Alliance for Suicide Prevention. Um, we did a, a series of evaluations. We also had community meetings with, um, with schools um, with school administrators, 
um, local youth and um, re and researchers to talk about what what needed to happen in Larimer County to reduce um, suicide risk among youth. Um, we also then looked at um, we did a, um, a systematic review looking at the university educational programs that are offered to see whether or not they um, they were resulting in a reduction in suicide risk among uh, college age um, students. We did a assessment of a suicide uh, prevention network in um, in Larimer County and also down in Pueblo. And now recently we've been looking at um, mapping assets of social and mental health services in Southern Colorado. So my path has been a research path, but um, obviously we work very closely with um, community organizations that are, um, that are doing suicide prevention. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Lorraine. I'm sure you had to condense a very long and amazing uh, career in a short amount of time, but it's, it's good to see you. I miss seeing your face uh, as much, even if it was on the screen. Um, Malia, would you mind sharing next about your kind of journey? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. I am Malia Cathcart. I am the Senior Administrative Assistant to um, our Chief Operations Officer, Director of Facilities, and Director of Marketing and Development at Summit Stone Health Partners. Um, a little bit about me, I graduated from Colorado State in 2018 with every intention to go down the clinical path in this field, um, but I did want to take a little bit of a break between undergrad and grad school, and I so I decided to get a front desk position at Summit Stone Health Partners. Um, in, in a really quick turn of events, I went from working at the front desk to supporting our chief operations officer, and from then it's been history. Um, I'm fortunate enough to not only work with the director of facilities and marketing development, but all of the operational departments. So since I've been with Summit Stone, which is coming up on three years now, um, I have been able to work on compliance projects, ITIS projects, um, a lot of facilities projects, marketing and development. So kind of um, here, there and everywhere. And, since then, since being able to kind of work on the more business end of behavioral health, I've decided clinical is not the path for me. <laughs> um, I definitely want to pursue the kind of back of the house operations when it comes to behavioral health. And um, for a while, it was kind of like in my head, I was just like the only way I can help people is if it's that one on one interaction through therapy, through counseling. Um, and since I've been able to sit in this position, I've realized I can help with process improvement. I can help, um, you know, open facilities to offer more programs to our community. And at the end of the day, it's just doing good work in providing services for the people in our community so they can heal. Um, so that's a little bit about me and my, my journey in the behavioral health field. Thanks for sharing. And yeah, I uh, couldn't agree more. I think those support positions are crucial. Um, and I know your position in particular is crucial with how many uh, scheduling meetings that, uh, yep. <laughs> that, of that I'm involved in as well. So yep. <laughs> thank you for that work. I know at our agency, our admin assistant um, kind of runs the show, to be totally mm -hmm. honest. So <laughs> very important. Wouldn't exist without you. Thank um, you. Maria, would you mind sharing a little bit about your story next? Sure, my name is Mariah Van Epps, and um, I currently work at North Range Behavioral Health. Um, I have always had a passion for working um, to help people in the mental health field. Um, when I would, did my undergrad, um, I studied at CSU, did my undergrad there, and um, I was interested in psychology, but also in business. And so um, I minored in business and majored in psychology, and um, when I got out of school, I was like, all right, do I want to go after counseling? Maybe I do. I really love helping people. And so I got my hands wet and got involved in some direct clinical care work. And um, that helped me find out very quickly that the direct clinical care work was not for me. Um, but I still really cared about people and I was really passionate about helping them. Um, and so I found another skill set inside the um, information systems department that was able to contribute to helping people who provide that direct clinical work and supporting them in their roles. Um, but I was also more interested in the system and business processes of like, how can I make the process more smooth and how more efficient for these people so they can provide that clinical work? Like I can support them in that way. Um, and so I went back to school um, 
and I'm, I'm grateful I didn't go back to school for my, my clinical degree because that wasn't my thing. Um, so I went back to school and I got a master's in industrial and organizational psychology because I'm very much interested in how businesses work and the processes and helping organizations improve efficiency. Um, and so I moved into a role that helped um, information systems do that. And then I had an opportunity to move over into the finance and billing side and help billing become more effective and more efficient. So currently at North Range, I, I get to work closely with Liz. I love working with her. She's fantastic. And um, we work together and we help make um, different changes on a non-clinical side. We support our clinical teams, but we also do really important work to help our organization run smoothly. And our organization is an organization that helps people with mental health. So I can still contribute and support um, an organization that goes after the goals and the passions that I have in a different way, um, using different skill sets. So. Thanks, Mariah. Sorry, I didn't get your name right either. <laughs> That's okay. It's tricky. That H, you know. <laughs> ah, we can always do better. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing. And I, um, I think that the field of industrial psychology is a really great, important one to get into. And I imagine that that's going to be a growing area as well. So I'm glad that we have a little bit of experience in that on our panel. Um, Liz, would you mind going next? Yes. <clears throat> thanks, Scott. Great to be here. So my um, pathway began many years ago. 1992, I began working for a group of seven pediatrics in Illinois. And I was had the opportunity to convert their practice from paper charts to electronic. And it took about mm, maybe 18 months. But um, I tell you that first go live date, there was a go live experience was very ecstatic. And over time, the clinicians were really, really happy that we made the change. Uh, but it was it was new, 1992. It was definitely new to, new to, new to the industry, and um, it was exciting. It was exciting. I was so happy to be able to bring them forward into the electronic health world. And then um, over the next 10 years, I joined a a behavioral health practice, and have worked for three different um, agencies two here in Colorado, North Range and formerly Colorado West, which is now Mine Springs out on the Western Slope. I um, had the distinct advantage there of having one implementation under my belt. And while I was there for 10 years, we actually did two different electronic health record implementations. Not something I would recommend or wish to do uh, anytime again soon. But I think what was really great about um, working with MindSprings was that we not only got to implement an outpatient uh, electronic health record, uh, we also did inpatient. And so that was new for me to be able to um, conquer that and provide that next level of support and care for clients, that continuum of care, which is so incredibly important. Um, you know, I think for, for my passion, I would say that because I come from the, originally from the front desk and billing side of managing staff, the revenue cycle, the revenue cycle starts right there at the first contact with a client. And so having worked with and managed front desk staff and billing teams, um, being in the position that I am and have been for the last, uh, I, let's say I've been with North Range almost nine years, and doing the EMR implementation and as the director of the electronic health record and data services, I have found that everything that we put into the system, we can get out. And so we are very involved in being able to provide vis visualizations and tools to our uh, teams. And um, what Nikki just put up for us was a, um, we had an opportunity to present and be a part of CCBHC, the Colorado Council of Behavioral Health, their conference was held last fall virtually. And so every year, the CCBHC um, accepts nominations for either what's called a Golden Abacus Award, which the business side of the house participates in, or 
Um, another one for the clinical side, which is eluding me at the moment, but I can speak very, very clearly to the Golden Abacus Award. And this allows us as the administrative side to present our, um, I would say, uh, abilities and um, kind of give other community mental health centers a look into the business side of the house. So with this dashboard, what we created, and we use a visualization to, tool called Tableau and our data warehouse where we upload all of our data from our electronic health record on a nightly basis and create dashboards of information. So this talks about the um, fact that down here at the bottom where it says number one, yes, we get reports out of our system, but those reports also help us inform our practitioners, um, clinical staff about what's happening in the organization. How many diagnoses do we have for a particular uh, type of diagnosis? How many are dual diagnosis? And then we move on to providing that information to the behavioral health care entities, onto our clients, onto the insurance companies and the guarantors, and then finally back for reimbursement. Um, we really try to leverage our reports and create work lists that provide action items to our clinical teams so that they can serve their clients more um, fully. Um, we do, we're very client focused. We, uh, one of our other goals, of course, is to reduce financial losses, reduce stress on staff. We want to strength, strengthen collaboration in that treatment setting between information available and also um, provide that data-driven solutions to um, our management team, our C-suite, and really working um, so that our clients can trust that things that we send them, possibly their client statement, is an accurate reflection of what they might owe. So I think that um, you know, behavioral health administration support on a daily basis can be fast paced. It requires a lot of problem solving. And also um, on, a, on, a, on the other side, when we're smooth, when we have smooth sailing and things are going well, that provides my team and, um, and me opportunities to work on new projects and also ongoing training. Um, you know, a day in the life for uh, myself or one of my teams is to assist the clinical staff with documenting any errors that they may have made, uh, pointing out some of those errors and helping them to correct them, spending time helping them navigate the system, understanding it better. Um, we also test out new software functionality. We plan for the state mandated reporting requirements that have becoming fast and furious over the past few years. We schedule maintenance of the software and celebrate our successes by sharing our data visualization dashboards. Um, I would say that one of my team members, one of her greatest strengths is that she has an art background and she was also has her master's in accountancy. So those two, uh, that combination of, of accountancy and the artistic eye she has been able to create some amazing, colorful, and exciting dashboards that present information and help us on our day-to-day -day journey of looking at the data. So I think really, you know, my passion um, is being for working in behavioral health is also being a part of a team. Um, we provide that data, we maintain that healthy electronic health record assisting the organization and making clinical program decisions because that's where it really lies is the clinician providing those services and what we can do to support them in helping their clients the tools the tools we use are like building blocks the emr captures client demographics the billing and the clinical information and also those important clinical outcomes so i think you know in closing that um, I've been in this business nearly 30 years and I could not be happier with what I've chosen to do. Um, so thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, I cannot state how important some of those systems and those data collection pieces are just to the overall field. I mean, if we don't know how good of a job we're doing and what we're doing, we really can't improve it and make it better for the clients that we serve, so.
thank you for doing that. And I also appreciate you highlighting um, some of your other employees and colleagues bringing their other education backgrounds and skills and passions into behavioral health, um, like with the art example. I think that's so crucial. I think the, what makes the field rich is having all this broad, vast experience in different backgrounds, right? We don't want all clinicians doing all of the work. Um, you know, we'd run into some mistakes there. So I think it's important to have a diverse set of backgrounds for that. I just got a quick little private message here. Someone wants me to share a little bit of my background, so I'm happy to do so briefly. Um, but also as a reminder, please put your questions in the chat um, for the panel and I'll be happy to ask them. Um, so just to give folks a little bit of my background and history, um, I have a master's in social work. Um, I went to the University of Denver, but I did a smaller program down in Durango, Colorado. So it was a small cohort model. Uh, so I went through the program with the same 20 people in almost every class uh, for two years, which I found really valuable, um, just forming those relationships and practicing those skills with each other. Um, almost everyone, I want to say 19 out of the 20 uh, in that program wanted to be clinicians, uh, wanted to do individual therapeutic work, maybe some group work, but everyone wanted to be a clinician. And then more and more towards the end of the program, some of us realized the importance of doing policy work, some systems work, um, and I found that the master's in social work program was really valuable because it did touch on some of those things. Um, so after I graduated, I did do a little bit of clinical work. Um, I was a youth therapist, mostly did youth substance abuse um, groups um, in southern Colorado um, and did a little bit of group work around the whole state as well, um, but then found that I thought we could do a little bit more on the prevention end. Um, so I started to do a little bit more systems work and got into working in schools, um, created some programming to provide youth with in-school therapy, um, and then realized also that that really wasn't enough either because we needed to work on some of the school systems and some of the broader culture um, that those youth were ex experiencing in school. So I started doing some restorative practices work, uh, wrote some grants to do trauma-informed care trainings for schools, and just started realizing that there's this whole ecosystem that has effects on individuals. Um, it's not all just in people's minds, it's the environment, it's their school, it's their family. So just understanding that integration of the systems. And what I found really helpful was that I still use my clinical background and education all the time for systems work. Um, rarely is there a meeting that I'm in that goes by that I don't practice some motivational interviewing skills. Uh, if there's a client or an agency that's resistant to some sort of change, what a great opportunity to practice some of those counseling skills. So I think um, getting into the field of behavioral health, your path isn't totally set. There's all sorts of flexibility um, to move and change around in there. Um, so again, just a little reminder, if anyone has any questions, put them in the chat. I have a couple questions um, for the panelists to get us going though. Um, so I'm curious uh, for each of you, why should people consider systems, policy, or administrative roles in behavioral health? Um, Lorraine, would you mind starting? Well, you know, as a researcher, without the systems in place, we don't have the data that we need to really start moving the, the targets and understanding risk and protective factors. So um, I'm deeply grateful for all of the people who um, are interested in, in that approach. And clearly, the policies are, are essential for doing the prevention programs, for getting the money into the system, whether it's the direct clinical care or some of the prevention services. If we don't have awareness about what the behavioral health problems are, we simply cannot um, function. So I, I think I think every aspect is is part of the overall kind of ecosystem to make everything work for everybody. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, Malia, would you mind sharing? Yeah, of course. Um, how I look at, you know, policy creation, administrative support, I look at it as the scaffolding for a company, a behavioral health company, to be able to provide services to the community. And um, without kind of all the behind the scenes work, it's really hard to be able to start new programs, uh, provide new services to community members. Um, so it's kind of like a domino effect in my head. And without that um, scaffolding of administrative stuff, um, compliance stuff, marketing, um, even facilities, you know, clinical programs would have a really hard time running. So I think it's a definitely a huge, huge part of the behavioral health field. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Mariah? Yeah, um, so in, in the role that I have, I do um, business process analysts. And so I like to, I will look at how we're doing business and see if there's better ways to do business and make improvements in, in maybe some processes. Say, you know, we've been doing this for this many years, but maybe there's a better, more efficient way to be doing this. And so when we look at options like that, um, we're helping to make the clinical work that we do more efficient and more effective. And um, without looking at those pieces, they could continue going on the road that they've always gone down and there might be better ways to do things. And so, you know, while change is definitely a hard thing to deal with, sometimes it's needed and um, having a role like, like mine or other roles that come in and um, look at where we can make those changes is um, it's important to make sure we can continue to providing top levels of clinical care. Um, I, th I think that's um, very important to make sure that we are giving our clients the best care possible and in, in ways to do that is making sure that our business is doing the things that we need it to do to, in order to do that. Right now without the business, I mean, we're not going to have that whole system of care. Yep. Um, Liz, what are your thoughts? So my background is of our newest building that we opened up about a year ago. It is in Frederick and it's the counseling center um, at Carbon Valley. And I think from a executive team level, I am so proud that North Range has been able to expand business in the, um, in the economy that we have had over the past few years and also be able to open new facilities and staff those new facilities, expand our footprint into not only Frederick, uh, but also up on the north side of Weld County into Windsor. So I truly believe that because of the infrastructure of our um, executive team and also our systems, meaning the electronic health record and the ability to bring information forward, we're able to make those business, important business decisions that allow us to continue opening new facilities um, throughout Weld County. Um, I really believe that it's critical to our mission that we um, offer the types of programs and, and the, the variety of programs that our organization is able to do. So that's probably, one of the most exciting things that I enjoy about working in this field. Great, thank you. I see we do have a question here. So what goes into starting programs that don't already exist? For example, there's a STAR program in Denver where social workers are dispatched on 911 calls. What goes into starting a similar program in Northern Colorado? Um, I have some good ideas and I also bet Loran has some good ideas because she's great at that type of thing. So. Loran, do you have some kind of steps about how one would go about creating a program, showing need, things like that? Well, I think it starts with the, the data. You know, what are the issues that you're needing to address and why would you want to have a social worker dispatched with the first responders? I think, you know, for people in the field, it seems like a logical thing, but for people who are first responders, it may not be such a natural. So it's a it's it's kind of a intergroup dialogue of how we can help each other. Um, do better at our jobs and reduce some of the adverse consequences if you don't have the proper training. I mean, it's a brilliant idea, of course, but are there enough social workers? Are there enough respond, first responder um, organizations that would buy in? And then what are the levers that you have to pull to get people moving forward? Yeah, that's really helpful. I'm always kind of jumping a couple steps ahead and I'm like, of course, it's a great program. But if you don't demonstrate that need with data, other people aren't going to be on board. So I think folks within the field understand those needs, but oftentimes we have to communicate that effectively with the rest of the community and with the organizations and industries that will be impacted or employing folks. Do some of the other panelists, or go ahead, Lorraine. Yeah, and I think it's also important to understand people don't have the same language. You know, we use different languages and the, the only way we can communicate across those is to understand what we mean when we're saying something. So that, um, and so it really is that, um, you know, it's an interprofessional team development, but you can't do it if you can't speak to each other. It's a really good point. And I don't think that can be, yeah, 
overstated enough. Um, do other panelists have an idea or some thoughts they want to contribute to that? Yeah. Um, so I used to also work at the mental health center at Denver and we did um, lots of evaluations for new programs and new funding and new pieces like that. So um, pieces that go into that are you have to have right funding. You have to have funding sources. You have to have staff. You have to make sure that um, when you're starting a new program, um, you can you can meet goals. You can um, prove that what, what you're doing is not only like needed, but also that you're meeting the goals that you set out to meet. So um, there's a lot of um, parts that go into starting a new program. Um, and those are all pieces, again, that um, non-clinical staff have a lot of buy-in for. They're the ones who pull that data. They're the ones who like prove those things. They're the ones who do write that, that uh, statement to get the grant funding or whatever funding that you're going to be out there. Um, so while the clinical staff are the ones that might carry out the, the work in those clinical programs, um, there's a lot of other people behind the scenes that are pulling the strings to make sure that we can have the funding and report on the funding and continue the funding and even gain that funding for those programs. So, And Scott, I think in addition to both what Lorraine and Mariah have shared, um, collaboration with those community entities is so incredibly important. One example I have of that is we have the co-responder program in the, with the Greeley PD, Greeley Fire Department, and a couple of other outlying communities, but three other communities approached us recently and asked, how is it that we can partner with you to provide that co-responder uh, services to our communities? And so we are, um, that administrative director is meeting with those um, chiefs of police in those three different communities and working hard to come up with a game plan and help them obtain the funding so that they, so that we can work with them. So that collaboration uh, aspect with those community partners is incredibly critical as well. Yeah, Malia? Yeah, just to kind of echo what everyone else has been saying, Summit Stone has collaborated with various law enforcement agencies for a long time to create our co-responder program. So we have a co-responder program with the Sheriff's Department, Loveland PD, um, and Estes Park, um, and that's just proved to be a huge resource, quite frankly, to the community and having those partnerships and collaborations with community partners is really big. Yeah, 100 percent. And then maybe just to kind of like summarize all those great things and those great ideas and suggestions. I mean, I, I think it really starts kind of like Lorraine was saying with collecting some data putting that in, that in a digestible format that folks can understand, the community and the public can recognize, creating a need, communicating that need, and then really collaborating um, on communicating that need, finding agencies that are gonna be involved, making sure they have their buy-in and that they have a voice at the table as well. Um, because if one person or one agency tries to push it through, it's probably not gonna be successful. It's really collaboration's key on there then always being open to kind of evaluate things. And then of course, a very important part um, would be funding. Um, so looking at different grants um, here in Larimer County um, with the newly formed Behavioral Health Services of Larimer County, we're lucky enough to have a lot of grant dollars um, in circulation. Quick little plug, I believe that grant cycle opens up this June. Um, Information is available on their website. Um, but I think that funding piece is really integral too. Um, but it really just kind of being open, collaborating, using data, um, and finding out what programs are going to be the best to fill those needs. Um, any other questions from the community? If not, I've got a couple other that I'm curious to hear from panelists. So, um, Go ahead and put more questions in the chat. Um, I do have one more kind of question to keep us going, though, um, for the panel. If you had one piece of advice to tell yourself when you were starting out, what would it be? And Lorraine, if you wouldn't mind going first again. That's so cruel, Scott. Um, I, I think that the piece of advice I would have is just keep your eyes wide open and follow your passions because they'll take you in the right places. But if you're not paying attention um, to the things that are happening, uh, you know, within, you might come out with the idea that you're going to do a specific thing. I never intended to study suicide, obviously. It wasn't on my list as a as an outcome, because at the time there wasn't much money for it from the epidemiology, public health um, 
point of view, I know there's a lot more now and a lot of things have changed, but um, it was it, it was the data, you know, and it was caring about the health and safety of, of farmers and farmers are really important to me because we need them. And if they're dying, they're not feeding us or clothing us. And um, and they are the most direct, blunt human beings I've ever had to work with. So if you're going down the wrong path, they'll tell you and enjoy that, you know. And so I think it's being that open to um, to that sort of opportunity and, and interest. Wise words. Yeah, I think being open and flexible um, and really listening, I think, are so key. Very true, Lorena. Um, Malia, any, any thoughts? Um, kind of along the same lines, I would say to just have an open mind. I know I left undergrad with the tunnel vision of I'm taking a gap year. I'm going to, you know, work within the field. Um, and then I'm going to go back to school, get my MFT degree, do family counseling. And that's that. And I just had that path and, things kind of fell into place, I believe how they were supposed to. And now I'm pursuing um, a, you know, a career path that I didn't even think of when I graduated in 2018. Um, and looking back at it, I was talking to Caroline Bunn about this. I wish there was something like this when I was a junior and senior in college, because I had no clue, you know, what went beyond, what went on behind the scenes of a mental health nonprofit in the community. And if I knew that, maybe I would have been more open to different career paths. Um, but luckily enough, everything kind of fell into place with me and I'm a big universe person. So I think everything happened for a reason and I'm, you know, where I'm supposed to be. But just keeping an open mind and just knowing that anything is possible. And, you know, even if you're clinical or operational, you're still contributing to a company or an agency that's providing good to people. So... Yeah, I'm glad you landed where you did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mariah, what about you? What advice would you have given yourself? I I would say um, don't be afraid to try things. Like, go out there and try it. Like, don't be afraid to, like, get into something and find out that you don't like it. And be, that's the way you're going to know. Like, if you're like, oh, man, I really want to go do this thing, well, go after it and and try. Because if, if you don't go and try, you're never going to know if you really enjoy it or not. Um and, and go after something that you're passionate about. Cause when you do work, you're going to do it all day. So make sure it's something you care about. Like I'm, I'm not I'm being honest. Um, I enjoy what I do. I enjoy the people that I work with. I enjoy what I do because I found what I am passionate about and I've found where my skill set works. So um, don't, don't be afraid to go try stuff. And I've tried lots of things to figure out that this is where, you know, I want to be. So don't be afraid to try. I love it. Liz, what about you? Well, I think I would have said, embrace it, embrace it all, whatever it is, and recognize that there are going to be moments where it is hard. It is, there are hard decisions that have to be made. You are working a lot of long, long hours to meet the deliverables. Um, but in the end, when everything is working smoothly and succinctly, and you're looking at uh, the output of the clinical outcomes or the data that you're interested in looking at, that's probably the highlights is um, seeing the end result. So definitely, you know, embrace the suck, but also recognize that there is great stuff on the other side. All of that was such gold. I just want the audience and folks who are thinking about getting in the field to really let but all those things sink in because I couldn't have put it any better. That was so important. I think it's so important to be flexible, be open, listen, take risks. All those things are so important. And then look back and enjoy what you're doing as well um, and make sure that you are in a field um, and in a particular area that you're enjoying. That's really crucial, I think, in anything we do. So thank you, panelists. Um, does anyone have any other questions from the audience? If not, I've still got a couple more for the panelists. We could do this all day. We could just have a great conversation like this. Um, I guess since I don't see any more questions yet, kind of maybe a closing thought. Um, where do you see the future of behavioral health? So like, where is the field going? What are some things that we might want to communicate to folks to prepare for? Um, 
Lorraine, I'm not going to pick on you this time. <laughs> but that means one of one of someone else is going to get picked on. So Malia, where do you see the field of behavioral health going? Um, everywhere and anywhere. I think, especially from, you know, the position that I sit in and all of the projects that Summit Stone has on the horizon, I can only imagine what that looks like for the field in general. Um, I think it's a field that is getting more attention and is kind of losing its stigma of ooh, behavioral health. I think more people are embracing it. And because of that, we're able to open more facilities. We're able to do more programming, um, which is awesome. So, I mean, sky is the limit, in my opinion. And I'm obviously optimistic because I love this field and I want this field to grow as much as possible. But I do think because people are starting to lose that mindset of behavioral health counseling therapy as a yucky thing and more of a, yeah, this does make an impact. This does make a difference in people's lives. I think um, there are really no limits for this field. I couldn't have said it better. I totally agree. It's exciting to see that stigma really lifting. Um, Mariah, what about you? Um, I, From my perspective, I definitely see more of a, a data-driven and technology-driven um, part of the, the behavioral health field coming into more into play. And I, like, again, I'm not a clinical, direct clinical worker, so I'm not going to speak to like where I see the clinical pieces going, but more of the, like, I see um, the data and the technology being able to drive what kind of business we do in the future and being able to back up saying, Hey, look, this is what we're doing well, or this is where we're struggling and having that data drive the decisions that we can make in a business. Um, so I, I definitely see it going more technology. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's, I'm really glad that things are really starting to be evidence-based and, and data-driven because we really have to be doing effective interventions and how else are we going to know if it's not data-driven? So I agree. Liz, what about you? Well, I know that on the state level, we're going to be seeing changes come down from state directives. Um, we're going to be seeing the, the need to treat the patient as a whole person. So um, not only behavioral health, um, issues, but physical issues as well. Um, being able to treat someone who has diabetes and to also move that information technology, move the technology through information, through continuity of care documents electronically, sending those to the primary care physician on a regular basis, working with, potentially working with health information exchanges. Um, although at, at Northrange, we've really um, concentrated on being able to share information with our primary care partners, with Sunrise and Salute, the federally qualified um, entities that also serve our patients. So we're, we're really interested in that interoperability of sharing of information so that everybody's on the same, same page when it comes to a medication list, a allergy, and their last visit, whether it was in an office or in the ED at one of our local hospitals. So I think the um, sharing of information is, is going to become a greater responsibility of all um, community mental health centers and all other providers. So I'm really looking forward to being a part of that as well. Beautiful. And Lorraine. Well, thank you for letting me go last because everybody already said the kind of structural um, conversation things. I, I think the integration of, of physical and behavioral health is critical to move forward. But I also think, you know, from my perspective as a researcher, I think what we need to be doing more of is looking for the resilience and the protective factors because I think that we, we keep harping on the risk factors and the negative sides, but we're really not embracing enough work um, to really push the, the envelope into how to help people before they get to the point that they're in a, a clinical setting. And so I guess it's my hope that the organizations that are concerned um, will come together and whether it's the schools or the universities or the healthcare centers or the medical or the clinicians, and then the, the public health community will do a better job of really raising the positives rather than simply looking at the risk factors and targeting them after it's too late. Right, I couldn't agree more. It is exciting to see more of that strength-based approach 
and focusing on resiliency and the protective factors really coming to light. So I couldn't agree more. Um, just looking at the time, I think we're kind of nearing the end here. Um, I believe, are there any closing remarks um, from someone on the committee to bring us on out? Sure do, Scott. So thank you. Uh, I don't know about you all, but I'm really feeling inspired and I was on the planning committee. So what a great panel to end our time together today. We hope you've been inspired to learn more about the field, what pathways appeal to you, and how to continue on your journey. Again, want to thank the CSU Career Center for hosting this event and for the City of Fort Collins as our sponsor. On behalf of today's speakers, the Behavioral Health Committee, and the Health Sector Partnership, Thank you, thank you, thank you for attending today. We hope you've been inspired to join us in the growing field of behavioral health. Take care.